welcome to the British Library. Thank you all for coming out tonight. It's a really special one. I've been trying to get Dr. Jen Gunter here for absolutely ages. You may have heard her on Woman's Hour this morning. The woman is frankly a legend, a rock star physician and the author of a brilliant new book. Helen, could you please wave it in the air? On sale tonight. Um, a special welcome to the audience joining us online. Hello, online friends. Um, you also can join in the Q&A. There'll be a Q&A later um, for online audience. Please just buy the book on the link that you can see and join in the Q&A um, on, on the platform uh, where you're watching. Um, it's my great honour to welcome you all here to the British Library. I don't know if you're repeat visitors. We've got a big exhibition opening up soon, a 500 years of black British music. It's going to be amazing and some huge events accompanying that to be followed in the autumn by medieval women which is also going to be really interesting. So we're always up to quite interesting and curious stuff. So please do uh, follow the events and keep coming back. But for tonight, you're in for a real treat. Do get your questions ready because they'll be ready for you and you could not be in the hands of two more capable experts because leading the conversation is Professor Helen King of the Open University, an expert historian of medicine. And they're both really primed and keen to... Oh my God, that's my phone. That's so unprofessional. <laughs> it was one of my kids. I'm really sorry. Sorry, apologies. Anyway, onwards with a huge round of applause for Dr. Jen and Professor Helen King. Thank you. <laughs> wow, thank you. This is so exciting for me. This is a mutual fangirl yes. experience here. Uh, I was on Dr. Jen's podcast a couple of years ago, and it was a big moment. And to actually be in the same room is terribly exciting for me. So I'm a historian of medicine, which doesn't mean I know anything about medicine. And most of the historical periods I study didn't know what we know now. So you know, I'm used to a system in which bodies are basically, women's bodies are all about producing blood from the food and drink that they have, and then it going to the liver, and the liver making, making the food and drink into blood, and then the blood whooshing around the body and going up and down and all over the place. So it's quite a surprise to me to actually understand what's really going on. So the person who can guide you through this, obviously, is Dr. Jen, who is not only an obstetrician and gynaecologist, but a pain specialist. Now, I think that's one of the reasons why you're such a fantastic commentator on women's bodies, you actually get pain. So I want to start by saying something a bit to, about how, how you got into this. So your own experiences of menstruation. You know, I don't, we, got, we have got men in the audience, so we've probably got some people who menstruate that we don't realize menstruate, and we've got people who have stopped menstruating, but quite a lot of us have done it, a lot. Uh, that a lot is actually quite yeah, important. A lot. How, <laughs> many, yeah, how many times do we do it? Well, 400 to 450 if you're not, you know, taking mm -hmm. contraception, you know, that would stop your period. So that, uh, that's a lot. That is a lot, isn't it? So when you started doing this menstruating thing as a young woman, what did you know? Well, I knew, you know, very little. It was the early 1980s, uh, late 1970s, and, you know, I had read Judy Bloom, and that, you know, thank God for Judy Bloom. And apart from that, I maybe had learned a few things in, um, like, teen magazines. You know, yeah. a popular one where I grew up is called Tiger Beat. I'm sure there's equivalent here. And there might have been little bits, but that would have been it, just like little whispers here and there. So I knew it was going to happen, and I knew why, but I, you know, I knew it was related to pregnancy. But I had no concept of what to actually expect, oh. like how much blood, if it would hurt, like nothing, to, nothing practical. No. So when it happened... Yeah. What was it like? Well, it was a, the first time was a little bit anticlimactic, which was a little yeah. bit of bleeding, and, and my first period wasn't painful, which is very common. Um, but pretty soon after, it became very heavy. Like I was soaking the sheets and soaking my clothes and having to double up on pads. And I also had menstrual diarrhea, which is not pleasant. And I just thought that was all normal because nobody talked about it. And if you call a period the curse, mm. then you're like, oh, I see. That's why people call it the curse. It makes sense now. So I, I had no idea. And my mother made it very clear that, you know, she wouldn't talk about it and I wouldn't want to have talked about it with her. You know, she was proud of saying that she didn't even know periods existed. And, mm. you know, she woke up and had blood on her nightgown and her mother just laughed at her. Whoa. 
that's yeah, that's actually really bad. Yeah, it? Well, you know, I, I don't Gosh. think she grew up in a great household, and no. you know, mm. but um, but she also wasn't too keen on um, fixing it for the next generation either. So what you're describing in terms of heaviness is is not normal, right? Right. But you didn't know that. No idea. Yeah. So when did you find out that was not normal? So I didn't find out that what was going on was abnormal until I was at my first year in university and I wanted to donate blood. And I was like, I'm going to donate blood, I'm 18, yay. And I got turned away because my iron level was too low. And so the very lovely nurse at the Red Cross said, you should go see your doctor. And it's probably related to your periods because you're an 18-year-old woman. And I went to see my doctor who said, that's normal, and told me to eat liver. <sighs> Okay. So I did not eat liver, <laughs> and I continued being anemic until I got into medical school, and I realized that I could take the birth control pill to stop my periods, and I promptly negotiated, you know, lied, <laughs> and got into the OBGYN clinic and swiped some sample packs of pills and got me, you know, so it was ingenuity and, and knowledge that allowed me to finally stop my periods and not have menstrual diarrhea and, and not have heavy periods. So you've men mentioned the menstrual diarrhea twice. Now, this is something I learned from your book. There are many things I learned from your book, but it's a big one. Tell us about why people get diarrhea when they have their period. Yeah, so when you menstruate, you release um, hormones called prostaglandins from the uterus. And prostaglandins are like pop-up shop hormones. So they appear at sites of inflammation and injury. And uh, they cause the uterus to contract. But one of the um, other things prostaglandins can do is trigger diarrhea. So I didn't know about menstrual diarrhea. And I was sitting in a lecture in medical school hearing about prostaglandins. I knew prostaglandins were released during menstruation. And when I heard that prostaglandins caused diarrhea, this massive, you could have seen the light bulb if you were sitting at the, you know, in the room. And I was like, oh. so I ran down to the front and I said to the professor, could you get menstrual diarrhea from that then? And he said, well, I've never really thought about it, but I guess so. And, and then I found out that menstrual diarrhea, you know, affects 12% of people who menstruate, which if you think about it is 6% of the world's population is habit, right? Yeah. Now, most people have never heard about it, but if you think about asthma, which affects 8% of the population, I'm sure every single person in this room has heard of asthma, and that is the culture of shame. I had never heard about this menstrual diarrhea thing, although I had it. And now, suddenly, everything is falling into place as a result of reading the book, which is extraordinary. So we're all learning. The other thing I learned that was a terrifying shock to me was that bats menstruate. Yeah, I know. Was that a, yeah, just tell me who menstruates. Yeah, so only 2% of mammals menstruate. It's actually really rare, um, which I know isn't exactly comforting while you're menstruating, but it's cool <laughs> nonetheless. And uh, so uh, we and um, lots of primates menstruate. And uh, so that is one evolutionary tree. Then some bats, the spiny mouse, and the elephant shrew. So it's quite a sort of an eclectic group. <laughs> sort of sounds like a punk rock, you know, like those, are, those could all be tracks on a punk rock album, like the menstruators or something. Um, <laughs> and, um, and so it evolved separately for us and primates, the, some, the bats, elephant shrew, and the spiny mm -hmm. mouse, and those are all separate sort of evolutionary branch off. And, you know, something that evolves spontaneously four times and stays is usually something that, you know, is beneficial. But I was like, who figured out that like elephant shrews menstruate? They're not, they're tiny. Like, they're like not going to buy pads every month, right? are they? Like who's sneaking around? Like I'm just yeah. thinking, you know. Bat tampons, it just yeah. doesn't happen, does it? <laughs> I know it gives a whole new meaning to vampire bats, right? Oh, wow. I hadn't thought of that. Well, I don't think when, <laughs> when you know, when uh, Bram Stoker was writing Dracula that he, that he knew about um, bats and menstruation, but great it does though. kind of. It's a great coincidence. Yeah, isn't it? So this, this brings us to that big question, doesn't it? Let's cut to the chase. What is menstruation? So, you know, these various species have all evolved to do it. Why is it such a great idea? Yeah, so, so menstruation is the byproduct of the menstrual cycle. So the point isn't menstruation. Menstruation is the consequence of, of the menstrual cycle. So all of the animals that menstruate have a menstrual cycle. And the thing that differentiates the menstrual cycle from estrus, which is what all other animals do when they don't menstruate. And this is when someone says, but dogs have bleeding. That's from their vagina, it's not menstrual. So they have estrus. So the difference between menstrual cycle and estrus is 
when a process called decidualization happens. So in the first part of your cycle, you're releasing estrogen and the lining of the uterus is getting thicker and thicker. And then you ovulate and you produce the hormone progesterone. And progesterone causes this irreversible change to the uterine lining called decidualization. It transforms the endometrium essentially into different tissue. And the decidua is very important because one, it's very thick and the human embryo then has to work to get through it. And the human embryo is very invasive. And so without a backstop, if you will, it would like go right through the uterus. It wants oxygen. It wants to make connection with the maternal blood vessels. So that has to be held in check. The decidua does that. The other thing the decidua does is if an embryo is really abnormal, it mounts an inflammatory response and triggers menstruation so that abnormal embryo gets washed out. And so we've all probably heard that 70 to 80% of very early pregnancies fail. That's because of the decidua acting like a biological sensor. And if you think about it in terms of our reproduction, human pregnancy is incredibly cost-effective, not cost-effective, very costly for the person and anyone who's been pregnant knows that. It's incredibly metabolically taxing. In fact, the amount of energy you expend during pregnancy is equivalent to metabolically to cycling the Tour de France. So, you know, and you didn't train for that, right? You just, you just had to do it. There wasn't, you know, you didn't get five years of training camp and EPO shots to get through <laughs> it and steroids and all that kind of stuff, right? So you're expending that energy of the Tour de France. You're then going through childbirth, having that historical maternal mortality, which you know might have been about like 1%, having the bleeding, all of those complications, then having um, to breastfeed because there was no option. And then human infants are so vulnerable, right? They can't even hold up their heads versus if you're a giraffe, you drop a giraffe with like six feet, it lands, <laughs> gets up and it can go and eat, right? So there's again, less you know effort. So to get a human pregnancy from conception to being able to feed itself is a lot of work. So from an evolutionary standpoint, you wanna invest resources into making sure you're expending that energy wisely. And so that's what the decidua does, it's part of that. But if you don't get pregnant, you've now got this thick you know, embryo sensing, embryo management system, and you can't use it. And the only way to get rid of it, you can't reabsorb it, is to dump it. Right. And so that's why we menstruate. Now, animals with estrus, they also have decidualization. But the difference is decidualization is triggered by the embryo contacting the lining of the uterus. So having that super robust embryo sensing quality unit being there isn't part of estrus. And so that's sort of, so that's the, that's it in a nutshell. And um, that's, that's why we menstruate because the process we need to give us the healthiest pregnancy, we gotta get rid of that and start over. So that's why you can pass something that looks quite disgusting. Absolutely. Like, it looks like a piece of liver or flesh or something, and you think, oh my gosh, what's coming out of me? And that's, that's the decidua. That's decidua, exactly. And that can even happen if you're on birth control pills because it's an effect of the hormone progesterone, and the progestins in the pill can act like that. So yeah, people come in and they'll be like, I took three pregnancy tests, and they're all negative, but I swear I passed something that looks like fetal tissue. That's decidua. Just as a matter of interest, I would never heard of decidualization. I thought it's something to do with trees when I, until I read this book. Can you put your hand up if you had heard of decidualization? Not, it's not a lot, okay. That's good, you need to read this book. It's, it's all true. Well, it, you know, if I can, I've been working on menstruation historically since I did my PhD, 1985, 80,000 words on ancient Greek concepts of menstruation. And, I had never heard of decidualization. Yeah. I mean, I'm a fully functioning woman and I'd never heard of decidualization. I mean, this is ridiculous. Why don't we know about these things? Well, I think it's, you know, well, the patriarchy. I mean, okay. that's the short answer. In a word. In a word. Yes. Um, the patriarchy. That's always an answer here for the question. <laughs> the patriarchy. It's a good and, answer. Yeah. Um, so I think that, you know, for so long, we haven't taught reproductive biology in any useful way to right. people. And when we started teaching it, it was like, well, here's how you put a condom on a banana. You yeah. know, it's like really, it was, you know, how not to get pregnant, yep. why getting pregnant is dangerous. You know, it was all the sort of fear-based, yep. you know, 
basically, which is one step away from calling women sluts, right? Like that's, that's <laughs> really what it was. And we're not gonna say those words, but we're gonna dance around it with everything. Yeah. So that's really been how it's been designed. Um, and I guess, you know, the coming of knowledge and power is threatening to the patriarchy. Yep. And, but I just explained it to you in a, you know, very short way. Like you, you could make people in grade seven understand the concept of yep. decidualization. Yep. Why shouldn't you learn this? But, you know, people graduate high school in the state saying, well, I'm pretty sure it's the same here, probably knowing more about frog biology than oh, yeah. human biology. Yeah. And I mean, no shame on comparative animal physiology. It's super- We all like frogs. But, you know, but, you know, it, we need to be teaching biology in a more practical way. Yes. And, you know, I think it just hasn't been thought of and it's been the culture of shame and it's squeamishness. I'm like, well, what do you think? Like menstruation is catching? <laughs> like, like you're gonna catch it if you talk about it, you know? Yeah. And what about dealing with menstruation? So moving into sort of historical things, rags have always been the answer. You know, women wear rags or you bleed onto your clothes right. or whatever. That's it. Now we have all sorts of other ways of dealing with menstruation. Can you talk about tampons? Because one of the myths about medicine is always that tampons, you know, toxic shock, they're all going to kill you. And if they don't, you shouldn't be using them because they're not natural. They're made out of weird things. They've got strange minerals in them. Can you talk us through the truth about tampons? Yeah, so I think, you know, a lot of that comes historically from, you know, the fear of plugging up menstruation, right. Right, backing up. So you I want think, to get it out. Exactly, yeah. that, that was a you know, long-standing belief. Yeah. Um, and also fear that you know, if you put something in your vagina, then you're no longer a virgin. Okay, um, and we'll come back to we'll that. We'll come back to that later, yeah. Um, so those fears are, have been there kind of as a baseline. You know, right. So it's easier to implant something on top of that. And the thing is, you know, there can be truths. That, so toxic shock syndrome related to menstruation is a real mm -hmm. serious medical condition. And in the very early 1980s, late 1970s, there was a new brand of tampon in the US called the Rely tampon, which was, if you wanted to design something to cause toxic shock syndrome, that was probably the best design. And due to its increased absorbency, but it's also increasing air in the vagina changed the environment and allowed overgrowth of a bacteria called staph, which then allowed production of a toxin called, called toxic shock syndrome toxin. And that entered the bloodstream and could make some people very, very sick. When that was discovered, there was new regulation on tampon absorbency and testing, and the rates of menstrual toxic shock syndrome fell. It still exists, but menstrual toxic shock syndrome is as common as toxic shock syndrome from burns or surgery, but you don't ever hear about no, those. No. Because scaring women makes copy. Okay, it's the patriarchy again, isn't it? Right, so because yep. you should get a lecture about taking care of your burn and toxic shock syndrome, yeah. right? You yeah. should, you should be seeing headlines about that person with toxic shock syndrome. And it just doesn't catch in the same yeah. way that scaring women and especially scaring women about the vagina. That seems mm. to really have this different cultural, sort of, you know, cultural weight if you will. Yeah. And so, you know, tampons are, are very safe. There's a very low risk of toxic shock syndrome. It's the same risk as getting, you know, struck by lightning. And, you know, we let people go out for walks. We <laughs> teach them, right? You know, we teach them about, you know, don't carry an umbrella or a golf club. Um, so, you know, <laughs> don't leave your tampon in for two days. Yeah. You know, so we teach people the ways to do it safely. But then we say, okay, you, you can go out for a walk because you know the basics. And kind of that's the same with tampons, with menstrual cups. You know, menstrual cups are also associated with toxic shock syndrome, but you don't hear about that yeah. because there isn't all this mythology about evil menstrual cup manufacturers, right? Okay, so it's also got the, yeah, the sort of big pharma stroke evil manufacturers right. trying to make money out of us thing going on. Right, and for some reason, tampon manufacturers are evil, but people who make menstrual cups aren't. They're very nice people. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, you know, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's capitalism is capitalism, right? But yeah. it's, it's, and the, all the products are fine. You know, every product that's on the market, you know, that, you know, is in the United States, you know, FDA cleared because they're not approved. But, you know, tampons that are made in the way that we expect them mm -hmm. to be made, menstrual cups, menstrual discs, they're all very safe. So there's another myth about cups, isn't there, that they can sort of get your uterus out or something? Yeah. Where did that come from? I, well, <laughs> I don't think this one's the patriarchy, actually. I think okay. this one is just ignorance. So, okay. I, you know, there's, there, you know, you... 
when you remove a menstrual cup or disc, you know, occasionally we say if people have difficulty that you can, you know, bear down. And of course, somehow this became an urban myth that then you're going to push your uterus out or that was going to create suction to pull the, and it's, that's not possible. It, that, that's not something that happens. In fact, when we're um, treating prolapse, we often give people devices that look very much like a menstrual right. cup. We give them pessaries. Right. Um, and some of these pessaries are actually quite large and some of them can create an incredible amount of suction um, because they, that actually is what helps keep everything up. And so sometimes it, they're so difficult to remove, people actually have to come into the office to have them removed. But gotcha. a lot of these patients are very elderly and it's safer for them to do that than to have big surgery because right. prolapse surgery is really big. And so, you know, it, it, it's a, just a different option. And, you know, so we're asking people to bear down. We're dislodging that suction in the office and we're using it to treat prolapse, right? So, right. so yeah, so I think it came from people who just didn't understand, you know, all of the medical aspects of prolapse and probably had never really seen a menstrual so, cup. So it's another one of those not really understanding things, isn't right. it? Right. So, yeah. you know, knowledge is power. Knowledge you is power. You say facts are freedom. Exactly. We like that. I know, you and I need to run for office. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> well, somebody does. Yeah. Can I take you to virginity? Yes. So... You're very big on virginity having scare quotes on it. Even in the index, it's virginity. I'm impressed by that. So the whole sort of it's all about your hymen and if you haven't got a hymen, you're not a virgin thing is historically huge. Right. Enormous. I mean, some of the stuff I look at in the 16th century involves anatomists trying to find a hymen because they're sure it's there somewhere, <laughs> but they just can't find one. So they keep dissecting and dissecting. And then they go, hang on, let's do small children. Great idea. So, oh, dead six-year-old. Right, let's go for it. Oh, I can't find a hymen. Let's do nuns. Ooh, found a hymen. Um, let's do really ugly women no one will ever want to sleep with. It's quite extraordinary misogynistic literature of trying to find this hymen. And yet now hymens are scare-quoted all the time and they don't exist. Right. What a relief. Yeah. Tell me more. So, yeah, I mean, this, uh, you know, my personal theory is, you know, all of the, you know, the historical, when you hear about people who've had pain with sex on their wedding night, it's because mm. they had vaginismus or sexual trauma, right. you know, that, you know, that is when you actually ask women how many actually bled the first time they had sex, it's actually quite low. It's much less than 10%. It's very little. So, it, you know, if it was this big, you know, thing that was going to cause universal bleeding, then you would have this, you know, you know, when people are asked, they would say it. And, you know, so, so what we know is when, when you're an infant, you do have quite a significant hymen. You can see it there, and that makes sense because you are incontinent. Yes. You have urine pouring all out all over your skin. And we know that the infant vagina is very susceptible to irritation. You can get a grain of sand in the vagina as a toddler, and it can cause a profuse vaginitis. Wow. So much so that we have to take a child to the operating room and clean out their vagina because they've got a couple of grains of sand. It's, like having something in your eye, like Gosh. that's the same kind of response. Or they get a foreign body up there. I once pulled out a Barbie shoe from a vagina. So, you know, <laughs> they, kids stick things in places they do. They're checking things out, right? So you can see how a hymen would have had value, and that's yeah. kind of the, the belief, kind of like baby teeth. You had it at one period of time, yeah. and then you don't anymore. And as the body grows, and then as you get exposed to estrogen, the hymen doesn't really have a purpose anymore. So then when you start evaluating people who are 13, 14, 15, you can see them in all different kinds of shapes. So you can mm. see people who have still a little bit of a hymenal remnant. You can see people who really don't have any at all. And studies have shown that when we evaluate people who have had sex and we don't tell the person doing the, the evaluation, they can't tell based on the exam who's been sexually active and who hasn't. Wow. Wow, so it's patriarchy again, isn't it? It's the patriarchy, exactly. Whoa, I think there definitely is a theme here. Yeah, and I think, you know, it, it comes down to, you know, I think the ancients certainly didn't understand the concept of pain with sex no. and vaginismus. And for those who don't know, vaginismus is when the muscles of the vagina are tight and that causes pain with sex, can absolutely cause a bleeding with penetration. And then you think about some scared 13-year-old married off to some mm. gross 60-year-old, right? Like mm. how, how terrified she would have been. And I'm sure there was like zero foreplay yeah. and it's all, you know, essentially yeah. sexual assault is the wedding night. You know, of course there was bleeding. It was assault. Yeah. Well, the ancient, the ancient medicine stuff I study, they, they use bleeding as an indication of health. So they think that your blood must be stuck somewhere. And if it isn't coming out regularly, if you're not having an every 28-day period, they're going to get out the beetle pessaries and, and insert them. 
and probably cause trauma. Absolutely. So that they will be bleeding, which they'll interpret as, oh good, that suppressed menstrual period has finally made it out. Right. But we would say, actually, no, you've just damaged the woman. Exactly. I mean, this whole idea of balance, right? You yeah. know, and you know, so many things related to medical conditions for women were an imbalance of blood. So yes. you gotta bleed someone somehow. Yes. And you know, signs of trauma, sign, you know, things that are dramatic like vomiting or diarrhea or bleeding were, were taken as signs that the medicine was working. Working, yep. Right. Yep. Um, you know that's why you see castor oil in so many you know old recipes because it can induce vomiting and diarrhea. So obviously you've got the toxins out. You've Let's just go on that tox on that castor oil thing. <laughs> so other things I learned from this book: castor oil. Tell me more about castor oil as a remedy and about its dangers. Right. And about that whole thing about you know it's a natural product, so it must be good for you in some way. Yeah. Mm. I mean. Castor oil is just a vegetable oil. I mean, you know, it's not, it's it's made from the seeds um, from castor beans, which are seeds of a plant, um, and they contain, so castor beans contain one of the most deadly poisons to human ricin. Um, so, but castor oil prepared commercially mm -hmm. is fine because they're separating it out and that's not a concern, but that is why you should never, ever, ever make homemade castor oil. Um, I mean, it's highly, I'll this is, a, can I tell you this offshoot awful story? Please do. Not in the book. So when I moved to Kansas City, um, it, when I was a, a, in, a fellow studying infectious diseases, there was this awful attempted murder and then murder by this female physician actually committed mm. the crime. I mean, and so her husband was cheating on her. He was an anesthesiologist and they'd gone on a school trip down to Brazil and she, he became mysteriously ill, almost died with sepsis, terrible. She'd fed him castor beans. Mm. Yeah, they found the castor beans in a person. Then she Ooh. later set the house on fire and killed two of the children. So she obviously, it's a terrible, horrible story. But so he yeah. almost, they videotaped his testimony for the trial because they didn't think he was going to survive the poisoning from the castor beans. Oh, wow. Yeah, so just to put it Not in bad. perspective how bad ricin is. But castor oil has been used for centuries. It's been used as like lamp oil and in soap and in medicines because it makes you vomit and gives you diarrhea. So obviously it must be doing something. And obviously if you have constipation, you'd feel better afterwards. Um, but it's also because it's been used historically has found its way into poultices and to induce labor. It doesn't really work for that either. Okay. And you now find naturopaths recommending it to detox yep. the liver. You're going to put the castor oil over your liver or to detox it. You're going to put the castor oil over your uterus, and it's going to somehow magically seep through the skin and leave the skin intact but dissolve fibroids. Ooh. I'm like, really? And Big Pharma hasn't <laughs> figured that out yet, the magical fibroid dissolving castor oil. Mm. But you've figured it out. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's become quite this thing, and unfortunately, you know, because of the rise, especially in the United States, of abortion restrictions, we're starting to see people talking more now about right. herbal abortifacients, and you know, this is why it's super important because people have used castor beans to mm. induce abortion, which only works because it's highly toxic and it's going to probably kill the person yeah. as well. So just important for people to know the history. And you've you got quite a good list of herbal things that really you should avoid. Yeah. In this book. So, so let's think a bit about that one and that point that we tend to think nature is good. If it's natural, it must be good. If it's manufactured, it somehow isn't. And, and how dangerous that one can be because, you know, death is natural. Cancer is natural. Um, these things happen. But does that mean we think they're a great thing? So, so natural remedies for periods, natural abortion methods. Tell me more about how that all ticks. Yeah, these so days. I mean, there's this assumption, of course, that nature is perfect. And of course, right. you know, I like to say nature's motto is just good enough. You know, get you out the door, okay? I don't complain. Um, and this idea that, you know, nature is the right way is really, I would say, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but really an ancient belief that way. You know, medicine yeah. and religion were very much the same. Yeah. Religion was all about being in balance with God, and you want to achieve the purity to achieve your God, you know, as godlike status as you could have on earth. Medicine was all about balancing the humors. They were very much intertwined. And when germ theory became accepted, you know, medicine branched off. Yeah. But, you know, we still retain that sort of generational after generational kind of belief and balance. I think that's why it speaks to us because your mother heard it and her mother heard it and her mother heard it. It's kind of almost like in our DNA yeah. in a way, right? Yeah. And you know, if you think about rhetoric, you think about terms like God terms and devil terms, right? And 
good, pure, clean, natural. Mm. Those are all God terms, right? And the terms I'm stuck using in the office, bleeding, cancer, <laughs> um, pre-cancer, you know, those, anemia, those are all devil terms. And so it's no coincidence that people who are marketing products have glommed on to sort of that nature yeah. is best because it's part of purity culture, which is something that we're still trying to shed ourselves of. Yeah. And, you know, it's using all this great propaganda. And this idea that an untested, you know, unregulated substance is going to be safer. You know, yeah. many pharmaceuticals come from nature. And then pharmaceutical companies realize that they can make the product safer for the environment and safer for you in the lab. Mm. A great example is Taxol, which is a chemotherapy drug. And it used to come from the bark of the Pacific yew tree. And they had to kill like 10 trees to treat one person. It was quite, you know, the ecological thing. And the problem is, is you have one season and it's dry. And then all of a sudden you're not right. producing, the trees aren't producing enough of the compound that you need. So isn't it better to make the exact replica in the lab under controlled circumstances so you don't have to worry about a shortage and you don't have to kill trees? Right? It's good. So Win -win. That's, that's now how we get tax all. Um, and so this idea that pharmaceutical companies aren't looking to nature, nature's full mm. of all kinds of great poisons. Mm. Of course they are. They're also then, you know, fiddling around with those products in the lab to make even better ones. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's a very good way of looking at it. So it actually it is nature. It's just nature but enhanced. Right. Yeah. And, and nature actually safer. I mean, nature has all kinds of cool bioactive chemicals. So, you know, that, you know, I, I think it's something like, I'm, I might have this off, but I think it's something like 30% of pharmaceuticals can kind of trace their origin to something in nature. Um, but that doesn't make them good. I mean, you know, there, you know, there are molecules that, that we can tinker with to have better effects. You know, we mm -hmm. can add an alcohol group on this or add an hydroxy group there and get a better effect or better absorption. And so, you know, if we're willing to make airplanes better and safer, why wouldn't we want to make molecules better and safer, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the, one of the things you mentioned in the book is that the danger of looking at ancient texts, medieval texts, and going, oh, look, there's a remedy for so-and-so, because we don't know even things like how potent that plant was at that period, or even whether it's the same plant as we now think it is, you know, because names change. Uh, illustrations in medieval manuscripts look nothing like what the plant looks like now. Is that because it's a really bad illustration or because actually the plant has changed? Right. Exactly. So it's really difficult, but there's still that, that excitement every time. Go, oh, ancient remedy for so and so. Right. Mm, yeah. And we don't even know what they had. No. So we don't know what the diagnosis. Absolutely. Was. We, you know, we're doing our best to try to sort of medical detective work, and yeah. you know, and some of the, you know, it's always interesting how the people promoting natural remedies have this very selective memory mm -hmm. about which natural products, right? So I mean, for heavy bleeding in the 1800s, they used to pack the vagina with lead. I mean, Woo. <laughs> like, okay, lead's natural. Is that, you know, but no, yes. but obviously that doesn't sound very good. You know, the, you know, bleeding, you know, um, has, you know, that has, you know, we're not recommending that, you know, nope. so there's all kinds of natural therapies, you know, that we don't recommend anymore because they don't sound very good. And so the ones that sound more palatable, the ones that you can apply the God terms to are yes. the ones that persist. Of course, in the 18th century, they also believed in vicarious menstruation, where it was coming out of any or orifice. So right. nosebleed could, if you hadn't got your period, a nosebleed could be a suppressed period. Right, exactly. Um, my, my classic one is always the ancient Greek one. Vomiting blood is a good thing if the menstrual period is suppressed. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> you know, if anyone says ancient medicine's great, you say, yeah, vomiting blood, it's great, isn't it? Really good idea. Yeah. But, but that sort of idea that the body is, the female body is just exploding with blood in all directions. Right. That's, that's kind of a weird one, isn't it? So what did the ancient, what did they think about when men vomited blood then? What was that? Completely different. Just men, you know, like women, pain in the shoulder, wombs moved to your shoulder. Man, pain in the shoulder, overused your shoulder. Right. So, just, so they were able to apply common sense to men. Yes. They just, just, yeah. Yeah, it's just, just totally separate. Yeah. Obviously, totally separate compartments that you put them in. Right. And so, as, as yeah. we were talking, you know, our, and I, I don't want to scare you all, but we do actually think Trump could get reelected. Um, yeah. yeah, we do. Um, you know, his comment when he was, uh, uh, you know, talking with uh, one of the Fox News people and well, she had blood coming out of everywhere. You know, that made me think of the whole. Yeah, it know. really is. It's quite scary, actually. American politics keeps coming up with these quite bizarre things. I mean, Todd Akin, 
when he had this thing about women can't get pregnant if they don't enjoy sex. Yeah. Because if they don't enjoy it, the, the female body has ways to shut that down. Yeah. Like, really? Yeah. Where did that come from? You know, it's actually, that's quite a medieval view too. Right. I know that, it's, you know, so a lot of the American politicians sorry. are really using medieval, that would actually I'm be a really so. great paper, is looking at the language of Republican politicians yeah. and matching it up with medieval gynecology. Oh, I like the sound of this. <laughs> I think that's, I think I a joint publication I coming up. I'm seeing a joint publication in our future there. Oh, this is fantastic. Yeah, I think we should go for that. And there's one um, from Wisconsin who uh, who was opining about um, you know about menstruation and pregnancy, and he knows because he's a vet. Because that's what women deserve is the latest in veterinary medicine. Of course, yeah. Now I need I've got a question here, which is I've caught all sorts of things I've learned from reading this book, and I had read the Vagina Bible already, and I had read the, manif the Menopause Manifesto already. I'm fully up to date with Dr. Jen's work, but I still learn things. What did you learn in writing this book that surprised you? Is there anything at all that still surprised you? Yeah, so one thing that really surprised me was how much the culture of shame about menstruation affected women in their private lives, like where no one else could see. So I read a, the a dissertation um, from a PhD student, and she had studied um, diaries of women in the 1800s in America who were crossing, you know, during the gold rush. And they kept, many, many people kept intimate diaries about what it was like crossing. I'm sure it was like awful. And they were very detailed in their diaries down to like what kind of shoes you would need, what kind of, you know, shawls and jackets and clothing. And they didn't mention menstruation at all. No mention mm -hmm of what menstrual products you might need or how many rags or what, what you would do with it when you, know, when you were out and about. And the other thing that she did, which I thought was fascinating, was she searched for the diaries to look for words like poorly or sickly, you know, codes for menstruation, to see if maybe they were writing about their menstrual experiences like right. feeling sickly today. No, it didn't come up with any cyclicity that would, you know, would make you think of menstruation. So even in their own personal journals that they didn't expect anyone else to read, women didn't write about menstruation. That is surprising, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Because no one's going to read it. So what's the problem? What, right. Why can't you mention it? I mean, I think. It, I mean, I mean, you, we know. I know from sort of English diaries from the 17th century that there's a certain sort of coded reference because they're interested in whether they're pregnant or not. So ah. if you're menstruating, you can't be pregnant. So it's a sort of disappointment moment. Ah. Want to get pregnant. Oh dear, you know, had a period, so can't right. be. That's it. Right. But no, nothing about what it felt like. Right. Or what the experience was like. Not or... at all. How they, how they dealt with it, whether it was painful, nothing like that. Right. That's the only time it ever comes up there. I yeah. mean, it's, it's, really, it's really fascinating. It is. It is surprising. And then the medical fact that I didn't know, which is super cool, is the innermost layer of the lining of the uterus, the, the part of the muscle that touches the endometrium, can reverse direction in contractions. So it can go in one direction to help move blood out and go in the other direction to help sperm move up. So I thought that was like mm. pretty fat, like evolution man, you know, that's kind of on yeah. par there with like an elephant's trunk. Like that's pretty specialized. <laughs> It's, it's brilliant. What about all these weird menstrual taboos that cultures have? Like you can't make jam because it won't set. You can't make bread because it won't rise. You know, all these sorts of cooking. It's always cooking, isn't it? Cooking related things where a woman somehow is going to pollute it. And, and in the 1920s, I think it is, um, Bella Schick comes up with this theory about menotoxin. Right. And this is a great story where he has a servant girl of course, comes in with a bunch of red roses. Red roses, red, I red, um, and puts them in a vase, and they die the next day. And he's really surprised, so he makes inquiries, and she admits she has a period. So he then does all these tests with different maidservants holding bar bunches of flowers <laughs> to see which ones drop dead. And he's quite sure that the menstruating girls are somehow polluting the flowers. So he comes up with this thing called menotoxin, right. which is like oozing out from every pore. Right. I mean, I mean the, that is very weird. The whole idea, you know, like, I obviously he'd never seen a female florist before, ah. right? You know, the idea that, um, you know, it's, yeah. it's fascinating, but you think about it, it's been so 
cross-cultural, you know, in yeah. many cultures, women are, you know, not allowed in their own kitchen. They're shunned from religious services. They have oh, yeah. to take a bath to cleanse themselves, a ritual purity. Again, we're getting back to purity, right? That, yes. you know, that, that women are further from God than men, yes. right? Like that's the whole point yes. is to keep women further from God. And that's how you maintain the power dynamic. It's how you maintain patriarchy, which is why like all religions are patriarchal. So I'm an atheist just to put that out there. Um, and so, you know, this, this whole idea to keep women impure and it's sort of like, well, really, so, you know, if women could like wilt plants, wouldn't we have wielded that as a superpower? Yeah, absolutely. Like, you'd be like, okay, hey, emperor, I'm gonna like wilt all the crops and cause a famine unless you let women vote. <laughs> like, seriously, like, right. really, it, it would be a superpower. It would be a superpower. But it's kind of convenient too, though, isn't it? Because if you can't go anywhere near the kitchen when you're menstruating, hey, it's a great excuse to go somewhere else. Right, exactly. So you just wonder whether some of this is actually a sneaky woman's power thing. So there's, I've got an interesting story about that. So um, when I was uh, in the second season of my podcast, um, I was interviewing someone who'd done a lot of work um, in, uh, I, I think it was in Indonesia, I, I can't actually remember the country, but with a very specific um, tribe. And the women all went, um, you know, to huts during right, menstruation. The menstrual hut thing. And yeah. so they, they had talked about, you know, well, we should, you know, tell the women that they're not poisonous and they're not polluting. And the women were like, oh no, this is the only break we get. We're good. Yeah. <laughs> right. This is the only time we don't right. do the cooking and the clean. We're, we're totally good. We're totally good with the seven days off. Bring back menstrual seclusion huts. So, you know, so I do think like on some levels that, you know, it may have been benefited time for women to get together, yeah. time for women to, especially, you know, maybe women of certain classes. Like I think if you were, you know, a scullery maid, you probably didn't, you know, get that right. opportunity. But, right. um, but yeah, so I think it's, it's, it's always complicated, isn't it? It is. It is. And there's some menstrual hut stories. Um, I've heard recent ones in cultures that still do that where somebody is sent off to this hut in the middle of nowhere and then something goes badly wrong there and they die because right. they're isolated yes. and there's no communication method. So it could go the other way, but that's fascinating, isn't it? Yeah. So are we ever moving towards a, a time when, I was gonna say a period, um, okay, <laughs> I'll say it. Are we ever moving towards a period when periods are just pff, whatever? Well, I like to think so. I mean, but not, I don't think in my lifetime. No, I don't think so. going backwards. I mean, especially because of where I live, you know, right. I mean, maybe if I was, you know, in a Scandinavian country, maybe I would have a different idea, I don't know, but certainly where I live. And certainly there are matriarchal cultures where mm -hmm. it's, you know, not a big deal in the sense that it is in patriarchal cultures, but, you know, the, those aren't the ones running the world governments. So. No, which horrifyingly brings us to the U.S. at the moment. So you mentioned the horrors of Trump. Um, obviously, Roe v. Wade being overturned, shock. Is it getting worse? Yeah, I mean, the stories are, are pretty terrible from those, you know, I live in California where we're not affected yeah. at all. Um, but yeah, the stories are, you know, very bad when you consider the number of states that are affected. And it's clear they're going for contraception. I mean, it was mm -hmm. always part of it. And that's what makes sort of this rhyme. People have probably, you've probably all heard about this kind of the rise of like the trad wife online, mm -hmm. like oh, TikTok yeah. and stuff. I mean, that's all part of this. And a lot of the funding of birth control misinformation online is actually coming from right-wing groups in the United States. So, you know, right-wing billionaires are funding that misinformation because, you know, if you want, again, create a second class, you know, you can replace God with government. If you mm. want to move women further away from government, you want to keep them in the home. You want to keep them away from education. You know, right. there, are, there are these TikTokers who are talking about, you know, the best way to manage your menstruation, you can reduce your bleeding if you don't use any menstrual products at all. Oh, super. Yeah, and I'm like, yeah. oh, so having women in the house using, not just bleeding on their clothes? So then you guess you couldn't be a woman pilot and then you couldn't be a woman surgeon no. and you couldn't be a woman librarian and you couldn't be a woman shopkeeper and you couldn't be anything out of the house because you'd need to be in the house for six days a cycle. Mm. I mean, what, you know. So, so you've come out as an atheist, I come out as a Christian, but that doesn't mean I'm any, any less horrified. <laughs> um, I mean, there's, there's, the Christian church has a terrifying record on this. Um, I was having a conversation on Twitter the other day um, with a colleague about Coptic, the Coptic church, mm -hmm. where menstruating women are still a bad thing, like not allowed in the sanctuary, keep the holy away from the women, you know. And he said that actually any bleeding, if you were, if you were a person of whatever sex, 
if you're doing any bleeding, you weren't supposed to take Holy Communion. And the, the theory seems to be that you're taking the blood of Christ, and if you're bleeding, it'll just sort of fall out. <laughs> Weird. But then I pointed out to him, how does that work if you've got internal bleeding that you don't know about, you know, because people do? Is that okay? He said, mm, they haven't thought about that one. That's the trouble. They never do. You don't push it. You right. don't push it. Um, and when you think about the, the history of the Virgin Mary's body, she supposedly stays a virgin. I do like your scare quotes all the time. Yeah. A virgin, um, even after giving birth. Miracle. Miracle. Um, and then the, the stories about the, the midwife, Salome, who puts her hand inside the virgin to check if she's a virgin or not. Um, so what is she going for? Right. You know? And whatever it is, her hand then withers. Right. Um, but Jesus manages to cure it later, so it's all fine. I mean, really. I, it's, it's, it's bad out there. Yeah, I mean, it's... You know. And when you're going to get to the whole trad wife thing and, and women's place being in the home and, yeah... Yeah. And purity culture. It's all, it's all horrible. I mean, that's the whole thing about wellness, is wellness is really a front for purity culture. Oh, you tell know. me more. Well, because they all use the same natural, right? So it's pure, right. clean, natural. You know, this is all, again, this return to this sort of nature-like, god-like state. So, you know, I spend too much time on social media, but I get really obsessed with these accounts that are, you know, they... People they try to troll me. I'm like, oh, you have never said any good. I've yet to have a good insult that matches the one that called me the vaginal antichrist. That I think that's awesome. That is the best insult. I, I love it. And and I so that's oh. why I still kind of read them because I'm kill, I'm still hoping for like another like antichrist level insult. That's great. Um, but if you look at the Instagram accounts of like Jesus loving mama, mm. and the Instagram accounts of oh, yes. nature loving mama, they look identical. Yeah. And you know. One might, assign, one might say she's pro-choice and the other wouldn't. But that would be like the only difference. You know, they would be both anti-abortion. They would be both the, you know, it's so amazing that if you look at even their personal pictures, they all <laughs> just look the same. They're, and, you know, the extreme left and the extreme right, you know, you end around, you know, fascism and communism, you end in the same place. Like it's, you know, you're reaching well, the same point. You didn't realize when you came here, you were actually going to get the entire view of politics, the <laughs> yeah. world and everything sorted because actually menstruation does that for you, doesn't it? Right, exactly. This is sort of like the Gunter King worldview of, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. It doesn't matter whether you're atheist or Christian, we share this worldview. Yeah, I mean, it's, well, it's all about, you know, patriarchy it's and control. It's about patriarchy, absolutely. And, you know, you think about, you know, scaring women away from hormonal contraception. Well, what has hormonal contraception given, well, probably about 60% of the economic gains that women have had, right? Mm -hmm. That's pretty frightening to the patriarchy. And it doesn't mean that people don't have side effects with contraception. It doesn't mean that we, need to, that we don't need to do better. Two things can be true. Con you know, contraception can be improved. Mm -hmm. We can do a better job. But it can also be really vital for people, mm. right? And so you think about all the people who have their PMS and their PMDD controlled with mm. contraception, have their horrible bleeding controlled, yeah. are able to have sex just for pleasure. What a concept, right? Mm. All of these things are so important. And you can see why all of these things are frightening to, you know, to, you know, the status quo. That's a scary moment. I think this could be a moment to start moving towards questions because we're going to have questions from online, but we've also got questions here, I am sure. So I think we'll have a go at questions here. Um, B over there is doing questions online. Yes, I'm just going to get the microphone. So okay. So there's right. been a moment. So this is a moment to compose your questions. Exactly. Obviously, if you're going to ask about your own personal health, this is probably not going to work because yeah. Dr. Gunther is not capable of doing a full pelvic exam on you now. Yeah. So, <laughs> so probably not too personal, but if it's, you know, if you can generalize out from it, that would be great. Um, at this point where I share the fact that, that I also had extremely heavy periods and mine turned out to be due to a blood clotting disorder and the reason why my mum said oh that's quite normal was because she's got the same blood clotting disorder so yeah this is this is where we all come in really and this, uh, this is why, you know, if, if people, so if you had had the information in the book and you knew what a heavy period I'd was. I'd have said, hey, mom, we're going to the doctor. Right. Because, yep. you know, this is clearly yep. too heavy. Um, and that's why it's important to not just ask someone, you know, in, in the office, um, you know, I'll always ask somebody, are your periods heavy? And they almost always say no. You know, and I'm looking at their blood count and I know they're anemic. And then I say, 
well, do you have clots that are bigger than the size of a quarter? It would be like a 50 cent piece here. Do you have, do you soak onto your clothes regularly? Thank you. Yeah. Do you have to change your pads and tampons more than um, every one to two hours? Do you have a feeling of gushing when you stand up? Oh yeah, all of those. And so it's so amazing how people have just don't have the practical information. I don't blame anyone for not knowing. If no one has taught you that, how would you know? So, yeah. you know, so don't use the word heavy, be really specific. Okay, we got a question. Yeah. I'll stand up for easier visibility, but first of all, thank you so much for coming here. I wanted to say a side note, I really appreciated you in uh, 2020. You really held your own against a lot of the online abuse that was coming your way and misinformation. Yeah. Um, and that really meant a lot to a lot of, you know, a lot of us um, in that environment. Um, so speaking of politics and you know America, um, I wanted to know what you think the the landscape of abortion in the US is likely to turn into. My family's from Malawi originally, and so watching the, where abortion is illegal. And so um, watching the US sort of drift back to that place is sort of horrifying. I don't quite understand why people will want to go there. Um, that being said, in Malawi there's sort of, there's a casual, how it actually happens is people will go visit a, someone in the village who will give a natural, abortifacent, which often doesn't fully work, mm. and then they go to the hospitals to clean it up with a DNC. And so this is, there's this sort of understated, you know, how this actually happens underneath the legal structure where it is technically illegal. And I'm wondering, and somehow that ultimately works in Malawi, although, you know, people get very sick from time to time. I wanted to know what you think that might look like in the US, you know, given that the legal structure is, yeah. seems to, it's, it's a lot stronger, um, and that folks are just, we're a generation or more removed from a time when there was an understanding of these quieter networks where people got these things done. And I'm gonna assume that the police aren't called when people go to the hospital, right? So I don't have any hope for any system like that in the United States because we're seeing right now women being prosecuted for, um, for suspected home abortions, not even having one, like suspected. Um, there was that woman who had shown up twice in early preterm labor, who was sent away from the hospital, wasn't even, even trying to have a home abortion, and then she delivered at home and they tried to prosecute her for, um, for abuse of a corpse. And so um, in the, you know, when abortion was illegal in the United States before Roe versus Wade, there wasn't this rush to prosecute. You know, I think maybe the punishment from the ill treatment you had from the backstreet abortionists, all these things were considered punishment enough, I'm not really sure, but the police were not involved in the level. And also probably talking about abortion publicly and you know, it was just, it wasn't done. I think, I think it was different, but, but now we're seeing this like rabid desire to prosecute. And we're seeing district attorneys getting attention for this. And in the US, as you know, district attorney is an elected position. Mm -hmm. And if you can get covered by CNN because you're hard on, you know, on these dirty women having home abortions, then you have name recognition and you're more likely to get elected again. So I think it's it's a really, really concerning situation because we're seeing you know, pharmacists refusing to dispense um, medication abortion, because it's the same medication we use often to treat miscarriages, mm -hmm. and so they're refusing to dispense it because they don't want to get arrested. So it's become this whole thing that it wasn't before. And so I, I think it's, you know, if it's, this is going to stay, and until there's you know, a federal law that changes things, um, it's going to be very hard to reverse thing in those states, and because the Supreme Court is basically bought and paid for, it's you know you can get a Democratic president, you can get a Democratic you know House, you can get a Democratic Senate, and you can pass a law that you know a new a new law, and then someone just has to challenge it you know, and in a year and a half, two years, whatever, it'll wind its way through the court. So it's a I'm very pessimistic right now, um, and very concerned Trump could get elected. And he's, he's publicly stated this week that he would be all for a 15 week abortion ban. Now how that would actually pass, you know, and you know, would, it, would, it, would he be able to get the votes and stuff? Probably not, but it also depends on what happens, you know, at, you know in all these other states. So yeah, I, I think there's a lot more compassion in, in the situation you're talking about. And I think there's a, 
a lack of compassion mm -hmm. in the United States right now. Mm. That's a depressing answer. Loads of questions. There seems a mass of questions there. Oh, over, yes. over there. Yes. So yes. in your role, I'm jumping topics. In your role as a health educator, uh, you've described, I would say, like a problem and a lack of information or misinformation, especially surrounding menstruation. And so my question is, who do you think bears the responsibility of teaching young people or um, people who menstruate about some of the topics in your book? Is it physicians? Is it church leaders? Is it, um, I'm American, we have sex ed usually in schools. Is it, you know, educators in that space? Where do you think this education is gonna come mm. from? Well, I, I think it should be in school curriculums. I mean, I think it should be a required curriculum and you wouldn't be able to get out of it if you have a, you know, a Catholic school or a Jewish school. Like it's, it's, it doesn't matter, you know, it's education is education, it would be a requirement. Um, I don't see that happening, but that's what I, I think should happen. Um, that it needs to be democratized in that way. If it's spoken about in every school, if everybody hears about it, then it's not a big deal, right? If you then make it secret and some people can opt out, once you start allowing opt out, mm -hmm. then that means something secret and potentially dangerous. And so the ability to opt out shouldn't exist. Um, and you know, so that's what I think. I think Absolutely, though, any, any organization that wanted to take it on, if a church said, look, we want all our young people educated and we're, we're going to do this in Sunday school, that'd be great if they were you know, doing it correctly. Same with um, public health departments. But you know, in the United States, all the funding in public health departments has been stripped. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, as an OBGYN, I rarely see someone who's 11 or 12 or 13. I'm only seeing them if they've got a catastrophic problem. So, you know, the goal of education about, you know, in the doctor's office, that would be something that would fall on pediatricians. And I think they do a pretty, many do a really good job about educating about puberty and the stages, but it's so much to cover, you know, in one office visit. And even if you had the most amazing pediatrician in the world who could do it all, who's gonna retain that after one visit? You know, cause you're not gonna go back and see the pediatrician for another year, so you've forgotten all those questions. So I think the best way to learn is having multiple points of contact, right? right? But I do think that ultimately it's the government's responsibility to educate the people and the way the government is supposed to educate us through the school system. So, so that would be my, yeah. my vote if, if I were in charge, if it was the Gunter King political system. <laughs> Yeah, well, the Gunter, the, Gunter, the, Gunter, the, Gunter, the King Gunter, indeed. The, the Gunter King political system, of course, only the other day in Parliament, we had um, a woman M M MP standing up and saying she didn't want any sex education whatsoever in primary schools because, oh, we don't want our children knowing about that. Yeah, uh, and it's misogyny. Absolutely it's terrifying. Much. Absolutely yeah. terrifying. It's really, it's really amazing how... You know, and you know, we see this in you know Margaret Atwood's *The Handmaid's Tale*, mm. the, ha you know, *The Handmaid's Tale*. But you know, she's famously said that everything she wrote has happened before. Yes. You know, this idea about you yeah, know absolutely. women carrying the torch for yeah. you know punishment is is a very real thing. And I don't know what people think is going to happen. Like. We teach kids how to drive, mm. and we don't assume when they get driver's ed that they're all of a sudden going to start driving on the wrong side of the road. We're like, you know, or they're going to start driving without seatbelts. We actually think them learning those things is going to make mm. them safer. Mm. And, you know, my kids actually had very, um, very progressive sex education in the school they were in. And, uh, you know, so, so much so that one of their tests was they had to label all the parts of the clitoris. Whoa. I mean, so that's, Whoa. that's pretty progressive, that right? That is, yes. And, um, and, you know, they spent like six weeks on this. Like, it was a lot. Um, and at the end of it, I said, so did this make you more or less interested in sex? And they said, well, actually, like, less interested. Because <laughs> there wasn't anything, like, there was no secret. Like, no. kids want to learn, like, secret new things. And it's just like, oh. Oh, okay. I remember, yeah, I remember going to the, when I was at primary school, um, having some excuse to go and use the headmistress's copy of the Encyclopedia Britannica for a project. I was straight in there to S for sex. <laughs> it didn't, didn't help because it was incredibly technical. But nevertheless, that was what I wanted to know about. Right. You know, and there was no other way of finding out. And you know, my kids grew up with like vagina, literally vagina puppets in the house. I bet you like, did. <laughs> um, like all kinds of stuff everywhere open, you know, like articles. You know, when I, yeah. I, I wrote a piece for the New York Times called My Vagina is Terrific and Your Opinion About It Is Not. And it was my first, 
because it was my first piece for the New York Times. I had, you know, the, you know, the, the hard copy of it, and that was sitting out on the table. They saw that, and you know, that's, it, you know, it, it, it hasn't done anything except, you know, yeah. one of my sons keeps tampons in his little bathroom in his little room in his apartment where he goes to school um, in case any girls who come visit, he, you know, any of his friends oh. who come over in case they need it. I love him already. You know. And oh. it's just, you know, he's, yeah. it, it's just like he just does it because he thinks it's like the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. You know, so. Wow. More questions. There are so many. Whatever, I don't know, you know, just <laughs> randomly. Hi, thank you so much. This is so exciting to hear like women talking about vaginas and periods. I think it's All awesome. The time. So thank you very much. Um, I've got like a bit of a comment, I guess. Have you heard of Qvan? Q Qvin? Um, it's an American-based company that essentially is using period blood to test. Mm -hmm. um, and it's one of those interesting things where you, you're like, are you serious? You can take mm -hmm. my blood and test it to, to make sure that my genes are okay. Right. I think that's quite fascinating, like that we don't talk about that either. Um, and that we have blood, as women, we have blood all the time, but like, it's taken this long for people to actually realize that it could be like a way to diagnose things that you don't know that's in your body. I think that's fascinating. Ooh. You don't know that. And yeah. it, it, it's Ooh. talking about the clotting and the things that happen in, in your vagina when it comes out. The problem that I found, and I think it's partly because of the patriarchy and because of how we live society and the misinformation and people trying to take money from you, I started thinking seriously, like, you know, you start questioning those things. Mm. And I think it's really interesting that there is this fundamentally new technology that could happen, and yet I'm questioning the the reality of that. Um, and I think it's quite sad that you're like, oh my God, this is so exciting, but they're probably just trying to take my money and it can't really be real. But then you think it's blood, so what, why not? Does that make sense? So they're testing yeah. it for various different possible conditions. Yeah, so yeah, you have so different you conditions in your body and then they basically, it's like a pad and then there's a, a funnel at the end. So your blood goes into the funnel and then you send the funnel off. Right. It's something only available in the US at the moment because I asked. <laughs> yeah, so I'm familiar with the product. I just know that was the company's name. Yeah. So it's just, so... Menstrual blood is just blood. It's also mm -hmm. got endometrium in it as well. But it's the same blood, you know, if you were drawing blood from your arm. So um, the idea was, you know, can we use it as a diagnostic test, basically just to replace a blood draw. So mm -hmm. this, any blood test that you could do from your arm, could you actually wow. do it from menstrual blood? Mm -hmm. um, and it, it is interesting that it hasn't been thought of in this way. Um, but home diagnostics are really a very recent thing. Mm -hmm. So the idea that, that you know, we can you know, test urine for sexually transmitted infections, you know, that's only within the last sort of 20 mm -hmm. years that we can send, that people can do um, you know, home, home um, saliva tests. That's very, so home testing is kind of very new. We've just mm -hmm. started now with home HPV testing for cervical cancer. So you know, I don't think, 30 years ago, you know, the idea of doing a home test, nobody, like, that just wasn't a thing. Um, they've only got approval in the U.S. To, to do a blood test for diabetes. So that's the only approval that they have so far. Um, and it's possible that they may come up from some, with other things. The thing that I think is far more exciting, I mean, yeah, it's nice to avoid a needle stick. And so for people who mm -hmm. want to get tested for diabetes, if they prefer to do it that way, yeah, sure, that's an, a different option. The thing that will be really interesting is if that could end up replacing HPV testing for a cervical cancer. Mm. You know, could that replace invasive tests that we do for endometrial cancer? Because while most people don't really mind to get their blood drawn, these mm. other tests are far more invasive mm. and far more painful. Now, if you could get it all done at once, well, that would be super convenient. You're like, okay, I don't need to get my blood drawn tomorrow because it's not an emergency. So I, I'm happy to wait for my next period. I'm going to do it and send it all in. Absolutely, that'd be super great and super convenient. Um, so yeah, I'm interested to see you know, where it goes. I think it's, it's also important to have very rigorous testing because we don't know if, until it's tested, if the cells from the endometrium are going to affect the test, right? Because some cells, for example, have higher levels of sugar than right. your actual blood will have, may have higher levels of sodium and other types of things. So they're going to have to go through each individual test to make sure it matches what you get from drawing the blood. So I think it's one of these really cool open areas. 
I too share your um, skepticism of direct-to-consumer testing um, because there's so many that get launched without you know, that they're clearly money grabs. Um, and so the great thing about tests involving blood is those do have to have a certain level of clearance. And so that that's, you know, going through this, this cause there's so many scammy urine tests cause those don't require that kind of that same level. So I think it's really fascinating and I'm glad they're doing it the right way. And, you know, hopefully we're gonna see new things, but I think the real money is gonna be whether we can actually then use menstrual collection to do the testing for endometrial cancer. That's, that would actually really be a massive yeah. step forward. So, yeah. Really interesting. Thank you. Uh, questions, oh, questions, questions, questions. We're over here. Is, is it all right yeah. to take a couple of questions from our online yes, audience? Yes, go on there. So yes. um, uh, uh, one of our viewers called Abigail, who mentions that there was so little awareness when, when she was young, says, what can we all do now in the push to create support for young people's increasing awareness around menstruation? Yeah. And another question from Joe, which is, are there physical physical benefits? Because we're hearing about the the things that are painful or problematic, are there physical benefits to menstruation? Um, well, so I'll answer the physical benefits mm. first. Not really. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not really. Um, the one cool, weird thing is, um, you've all heard about forever chemicals, right? That you, you, know, you can't get rid of the, you know, mm. the, all the plastic, microplastics yeah. and for phthalates and all these like forever chemicals we're exposed to. Um, women who menstruate have lower levels in their body because if you're losing blood every month, you're, you're able to get rid of some of those chemicals right. because then you have to make new blood to make up for it versus those chemicals can't come out in your urine. And so then once you go through menopause, then the levels you know, go back okay. up again. Um, so, but you know, that's obviously not enough of a health benefit. So, so no, there isn't really um, because we don't see any change in health status when people go on hormonal contraception that, you know, that stop periods. We do see less anemia. So obviously that's good from that standpoint. Um, and uh, from a what can we do as a society? Um, well, you could buy my book for everybody. Um, but that's obviously very self-serving. Children's um, level. Yeah. You, need, you need to do a simple version so, for young teens. I think what people can do on an individual level is they can get involved with their school boards. You know, get involved locally with politics. I think yeah. we often think about politics on like, a, you know, who's the prime minister, who's the president, yeah. you know, all these big people in the cabinet. And while obviously they're super important, local politics really matter. And even at a school board level, you can be like, hey, I want to know what are we teaching in our school district? Why can't we do this? Why can't we have a proper curriculum? You know, there are all kinds of books that are out there that we could be introducing. And what could we do at a local level at our school? What can I do in my church? What can I do in my synagogue? What can I do? You know, churches can absolutely, historically, they've, you know, been places where people can learn things, synagogues, but, you know, so in my temple, how can we, you know, how can we do this at a local level? You know, I think that people discount what can happen locally, and I think people can actually have more impact than they think, because, you know, eventually that spark takes hold, and then, you know, and then it grows. And then once you get a program in your local area, then you can say, hey, we're happy to give our local program to the next borough or to the next town or to the next synagogue and then have it grow that way. Mm. Row it out. Uh, lady in the bluish jacket with the white thing. So it's just, just, I'm, I'm just being completely arbitrary here. Yeah, bluish is good, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, this is incredibly interesting. I wanted to talk a little bit about a, a rather alarming phenomenon I think that we have now because I agree absolutely with what you say around education but there are millions of women who are no longer at school or university mm. and who are mainly relying on social media yeah. as their source of information and the problem we have is that medical professionals, health professionals are bound by codes of practice mm. and you can't comment clinically online about somebody because you're not in a clinical context. But that doesn't stop the vast amount of influencers out there saying all sorts yeah. of things. And I, I admire um, how you do tackle this head on um, because it has to happen. But the trouble is that there's just millions of people out there, I think, who are influenced, no pun intended, by, by these individuals. And how do they get the right information? Because it's often very hard 
certainly here in the UK, to get to see your doctor, there's often a, a sense of mistrust now, sadly, around experts, yet actually the experts are the people who really can help. And I think it's incredibly alarming the direction we're going in now. And I wondered if you had any thoughts on what yeah. you do about the, the millions of us who aren't at school and, and can't have that sort of input, that obvious way of inputting mm -hmm. the, the right information. Subscribe to the Vagenda. <laughs> yeah, so that's my blog, the Vagenda, absolutely. Um, but I think I share your concern. Yeah. So the thing about propaganda is it works, and that's what influence do. They, they, you know, you, you are on social media, you're on TikTok, you see a video that's got disinformation. It's fear-based. Fear makes you watch to the end of the video. It's fear-based, you watch it, now that's stuck in your mind, and maybe the third or the fourth video you're now shown has the same, very similar thing, because the algorithm learns very quickly what scares you, what you're watching. It knows what you touch. It's amazing what it learns, and it learns very, very quickly. So in a span of an hour, you might have seen that same piece of disinformation presented now five different ways. And then maybe you went in the comments section, and then you read more about it, and it amplified that fear. And that's become a fact for you. And Propaganda is so effective. Um, they've done studies where they feed people ridiculous information. How ridiculous? The earth is a perfect square. The tallest person is 35 feet, things mm. like that. And after five exposures, the needle starts to move on whether people start to think that could be true or not. Wow. And then you think about political propaganda. How do people vote for things that are obviously not in their own best interest because of propaganda? And so it's a, I think it's a bigger problem outside of medicine, but from a medical standpoint, what we need to do is teach people online literacy. It's a really yeah. important for everything in your life, but especially for medicine. And the problem is, is when you go to look something up, you just Google it. But the thing about snake oil and influencers, they infiltrate and they are actually excellent at search engine optimization. So if you're just Googling something, the chances that disinformation is going to come up first are actually really high. They've also done studies when people go and search for information online, they end up more uninformed because of that very reason. So we actually have to teach people literacy. And what the studies tell us is the very first time you hear a fact online, you've got to stop and get off the platform. And you actually have to look it up and learn how to look it up. Mm -hmm. And I don't see how that works with the way we consume social media. So I wish I had an answer. Um, I think the, the best answer is, teaching people about the dangers of, of online information and how they need to really invest in each and every time looking after themselves. Because influencers don't care. You know, they either believe the garbage themselves or they're just promoting it because they know fear gets clicks. The more clicks they get, the more they can charge for the next ad that they're going to do. So their currency may just be attention. It may not even be the lie about the tampon. And so it's it's really a very dangerous time, I think. And I, I like I said, I wish I had a good answer, but I'm very concerned. I mean, I catch my kids all the time. I'm like, where did you hear that? And they say it with such confidence. And I'm like, okay, you heard that from some TikToker, right? So let's take it apart. And it might sometimes take me 20 or 30 minutes of sitting down with them to actually undo that. That's how like strong yeah. that influencer power is. And those are just the things I heard about from them. You know, I don't know how many things they've heard that I don't know about, so. Yeah, I mean, even before you get to the, the, the social media thing, and I've done a talk for various um, groups of students college students um, level, where I've looked at the Hippocrates Wikipedia page, and the Hippocrates Wikipedia page has this story about Hippocrates being put in prison. And you're like, what? I didn't know that. Uh, that's because it never happened. And, but once you start following it, in terms of who then quotes that, the thing that really shocked the students when I've talked them through this and you know, done slides of this is, this is where it went to, and this is when it first turned up on the Wikipedia page, two weeks later it's here. You know, nowadays it'd be far quicker than that. But the thing that shocks them is that it even gets into printed books, books published by respectable publishers like Oxford University Press. And they're like, whoa, you know, I knew that the internet was a bit iffy, but I didn't realize books could be iffy too. And that was, that's quite a moment. But actually taking a story and following the way it develops, and then it, you know, it sort of grows, you know, like it's always got the name of the prison. It's, it's just, it goes and goes and goes. Once you've got a, a myth, it just sort of pulls things into it and it gets bigger and bigger. But actually having an example that you can show it on is quite powerful. 
And then there's this other thing. So how many people here have heard of predatory journals? Yeah. So, so some people, but not a lot, not everybody. So there are these things in yeah. science, and I'm sure it's in all, oh, yes. at, where, wherever there's publications, so yes. arts and the science, um, that are predatory journals. And basically, you can submit junk. Yeah. You can write, my name is Spot, I have a dog. You can literally write garbage and submit it and get it accepted, because you're paying $5,000 yeah. to get it in. Okay. Now, if you're an academic and you're struggling, they don't, most universities don't look at the quality of your journals, they just look at the numbers. And so there's been this creep with this increase and increase in, in these predatory journals. And so many times, like I'll look at things that people are quoting online and I'm like, okay, so four out of your five things that you use as a reference, those are predatory journals. Mm -hmm. Right? Total junk science. They don't have good editors that have reviewed them. No. And initially, some of these journals started out okay, and they had actually like real people on the editorial board. And then there would be a journal, an article that all three of them would say, oh, this is garbage. We can't accept this. And five days later, it's published mm. because they paid $5,000. And once it's up there, if it's online, then it's got a journal name on it. And people think, oh, wow, that must be okay. Yeah. And then it gets quoted again and again and again. And it's, it's, and it's a, a scary thing. A lot of these journals use terrible tactics like... You know, if there's a, a proper journal called Cell, well, then they use cells. You know, that's kind of an example. Like, so they often have names that sound very similar. And so that's just a whole nother level of disinformation. So there's a journal called History, and I was approached yesterday by a journal called Histories. Um, asking if I got any articles. Oh, yeah, they wanted me to do a podcast based on a book review I'd done. Like, who does a podcast on a book review? And of course, you know, they wanted money. Right. You're That's gonna the pay point. Them for the I'm going to pay them. I just know, yeah. but but people fall for it, and then once it's up online, it looks like a real journal. Yeah, yeah. No, last it's week scary. I was asked if I wanted to write a you know a, a review on nutrition in the menstrual cycle, and they were quoting all of my fantastic work on it. I'm like, I haven't published anything on this, but you know, <laughs> and then I could write about it for five thousand dollars. Yeah, of course. So. No, it's really scary stuff. Question. There's two people here being really patient. So, yes. Have the hands up, like, we'll get both as soon as anyone. So. One and then, yep, yes. Can we do that? Um, it feels like we're hearing a lot at the moment about um, the history of a lot of pharmacological research mm -hmm. um, and how it's been done almost exclusively on men because yes. the, the female hormonal cycle was deemed too complex yeah. to understand how that would affect the outcome um, because of patriarchy. Um, how true is that mm. and how do we fix it now because these these drugs have been in use for decades and decades yeah. and they're prescribed like smarties and and how how do we assess if they are actually effective for everyone right so um so a lot of it is um is true um but some of the history of how it started um to kind of put it in context so you know, in the 1950s, 1960s, I mean, things were, stu were studied, but, you know, wasn't very often. Um, and then thalidomide. Yeah. And, um, and the UK and Canada, you know, understand what happened. Actually, my mother was, my parents are from Newcastle, and my mother was here when she was pregnant with my brother, and she was nauseated, and she was given thalidomide. Okay. And she threw it wow. away. Um, and so my mom was offered it, but didn't yeah. take it. You so, were, this is scary, the yeah. case. Yes, so, that was the era. So, um, mm -hmm. thalidomide, so thalidomide didn't get approved in the, night, in the United States because there was this lone woman in the FDA who was like, wait a minute, you know, this, like, there's this, you wow. know, you know, sort of, and so there was a delay and a delay and a delay, and then, of course, all the awful reports came out about the limb reduction yeah. effects, and so America was spared from thalidomide. So there was that fear that any new drug could potentially mm -hmm. be the next thalidomide. Yeah. And I mean, it, the reports were pretty, uh, very catastrophic, obviously. So you can understand that. But for pharmaceutical companies, that was really a great way of saying, oh, okay, well, then mm. we just shouldn't study women because, mm, you too know, because thalidomide. Mm. Um, of course, <laughs> there are ways around that. There are ways of making sure people aren't pregnant. Yes. There's ways of, you know, e there's, there are ways around this, but it takes money and capitalism wants the easiest answer, mm -hmm. right? And so this very real thing was able to be sort of turned into this great excuse because it is more complex to study people whose hormones change mm -hmm. every day than people who don't. And you can understand at a capitalistic level, of course, you, wanna, you want to have the most homogeneous, easy to study population. And so that's just how it became. And that was just generation after generation, just we barely included women in these trials, you 
you know, medicine became basically medicine for men. And it wasn't until in the United States in 1993, I'd already been a doctor for three years, that a law was passed that if you're going to get federal funds for research, you have to include women if it's appropriate for the trial. So obviously if it's for erectile dysfunction, you don't have to, but if it's for <laughs> you know, hypertension, if it's for high cholesterol, if it's for anything else, you must include women, 1993. Um, so then you think about like how much basic science do we not know? Yeah. And you know, we just don't know what we don't know, right? If you haven't studied something, you don't know. Maybe it's all gonna be the same. Maybe it's not. Mm. Maybe it's gonna make a difference if somebody has had preeclampsia before. Mm or not, right? So, you know, not all women are the same. There are people who have, you know, maybe hypertension in women is different based on their pregnancy history. Again, we don't know until we study it. And then the further legacy from that is, you know, so then if you have less funds to, so if you're not thinking about studying women for hypertension, then you start not thinking about studying them for other things, right? If you're not studying for medications, then you just don't think about studying them. And then, Basic, the new basic science researchers who are coming up, well, they don't think about studying women. Well, you know, so it becomes sort of it begets this this sort of bigger problem, right? Where it just becomes branching out because people just don't think about it because, well, well, in my lab we didn't do this, so you know, it just begets the next generation, and then you start thinking about, you know why would you study women's health at all? Because it's just too much, it's harder, and well, there's less money in it. And so then you have less people wanting to study things like endometriosis mm -hmm. or things like polycystic ovarian syndrome because there's less money in it. If you, you need the money to open a lab, you need the money, like research is so expensive. So you can see how then making it harder starts to push everybody in another direction, even very well-meaning people because, you know, if you you don't get the grants, you can't have a lab. So, you know, now we've seen a big investment in the US, apparently from President Biden, and that we're going to, you know, it takes money to correct things. And so hopefully, you know, we have many more people asking questions and we're starting to move in a different direction. But that's kind of the history. It's actually more complicated than we thought. Everything always is. It always but, is. But, you know, it's, it, it's, you can see how people used something to make an excuse to make, yep. you know, make it a lot easier to, yeah. to, for their pocketbooks. And so we promised the person next to you yeah. that they would get to answer their question. So we did. One more in front. Okay. Thanks. Thank you for your um, talk. It's been great. Um, I guess I kind of got a question that's linked to the two previous questions. Um, I mean, I think social media, I personally think social media is, um, I find it very conflicting because I think it's very, it can be a, a force for, mm. a positive force because I wouldn't have known about you if it hadn't been for social oh, media. So, yeah. um, I guess I agree with the points about kind of like people need to be literate online, they need to check their sources and things like that, but I guess the general population haven't been taught critical thinking in that way necessarily and checking sources um, uh, is not something that's widely, you don't teach in schools necessarily. Um, but um, I have kind of a specific question more to do with contraception. So. I've seen kind of a rise online of, of women um, questioning the contraception that they're on and deciding to come off it because they feel that it's not natural. And I think there's um, value in women questioning things that they've just been told they should go on um, or um, doing research and working out what's right for them and being empowered to make that choice. But um, there was also seems to be a rise in kind of like, not necessarily doctors, but people that have kind of, some kind of qualification, but not specific in these areas, writing books, writing articles about like, you know, the pill and for example, and how, how it can be negative and it can cause all these things. And there's this thing called natural cycles, which everyone, yeah. all the influencers are promoting, which I think can be a good thing and a bad thing. Um, I just guess wonder what your thoughts are on that. And also, do you think that like right-wing politicians possibly could jump on that bandwagon of like trying to um, stop women using contraception because they're promoting it as, oh, you know, well, the pill is demonizing the pill basically and the pill is not natural and it's not this and it's not that. Oh yeah, I mean, just this week, Elon Musk yeah. has been, you know, yeah. chomping at the bit for that and promoting disinformation. So I think the first question about sort of social media, I absolutely agree. I learn all kinds of great things on social media and there's all kinds of garbage as well. And how do you decide? And you know, when I was, I don't know, maybe in grade two or grade three, they taught us how to use the library. We had to go, so you won't know this, 
we had to learn how to use the card catalog. Ooh. And we ha were tested on it. We had to learn about the card catalog. We had to learn how to use the card catalog. We were tested on, we had to research something and find the book using the card catalog. And if I was thinking back, like, you know, when I was in grade four and grade five, if I had known how to use the card catalog in the library, I wouldn't have known about all the amazing books and all the things I could have learned. If no one had taught me how to use the microfiche and all the things that we had to use in the library to research, I would have been stuck reading the magazines at the front that were there in the newspaper. That's why I wouldn't have known how to use the library. So I think we need to teach people how to use social media for, for sort of you know social media literacy in the same way we used to teach people how to use the library, how to use the card catalog. Um, so that would be kind of my answer to that. You know, with the disinformation online about hormonal contraception, there's absolutely a massive funding from the right wing for that. There's also a lot of push from naturopaths who are then also selling products to cure you from the problems the pill caused, right? So you might have heard something called post-birth control pill syndrome. It is a completely made up thing from a naturopath who conveniently sells supplements to treat that. So a naturopath can't treat all of your supposed hormonal problems if you're on the medication for it, right? So there's also that. But there's also the truth that birth control pills cause side effects for some women. Mm. So you have to kind of hold space for all of these things being true. There can be malicious actors. Um, there can be equally malicious medical professionals. And there can also be people who are having real side effects or things that are understudied. And so that's kind of the problem, is that how do you sort out kind of which is which? Um, you know, I think that we now more than ever have more options for contraception, which we didn't have 20 years ago, which is also an amazing thing. And I think that we need to have a, just a greater explanation about all of the things. But I would say that this idea that you know following your cycles naturally is better is certainly you know not something that you know what's the definition of better? Um, how important is it is for you to not be pregnant? It would be the question for someone who's heterosexual. What are the things that you're hoping contraception can do for you? How much are you willing to do to not be pregnant? You know, are you willing to track every single day? Are you willing to check your cervical mucus? Are you willing to check your temperature? Are you able to avoid sex during the time that you may be fertile? Is it okay if you get pregnant? If you get pregnant, can you access birth, you know, um, abortion if you want it? So it requires a much greater discussion than you know can happen on social media. And I would say one thing about some of the apps, you know, they well, most of them sell your data. Yeah. So we know that it takes very little data to find out who someone is, so there's also that. Um, and um, we also know that some of the apps aren't that accurate, and when women use them just to learn more about their cycles, if their period comes at a time different from the app predicting, the women are more likely to blame themselves when actually it was the app's <gasps> algorithm that was wrong. Whoa. So... You know, it's always more complicated than it seems. And actually, I cover all of that, you know, in the book, so. Which is a great moment to say. <laughs> the book is available outside, and Dr. Jen will sign it. I think we need to stop there, because otherwise we'll go on all night. Massive thanks to Dr. Jen. Massive thanks to all of you who've asked amazing questions. I think this has been extremely informative for all of us. And, you know, this is the woman. Just follow her. Social media. Twitter, go for it, follow the agenda, read the books, you need to, and I still think we need the teen version of this book. Can we all thank Dr. Jen very much? And I just wanna add that this has been the highlight <laughs> of my book tour. So I told you can, my husband will absolutely vouch for me when I said, I just want to be able to be interviewed by Helen King. And when you said yes, I was so excited. I just so. And, How could I have said anything else? And this has been everything Such fun. that I hoped it was. So thank you so much. Thank you, you are a force. Whoa. Thank you very much.